I'm going to shift gears now. We talked a lot during our Twitter conversation about these recent FDA submissions for Axie Pembro, for Axie Avelumab, and so forth. And, and I wanted to get a sense before we really jump into the nitty gritty of the data, you know, how the goals of treatment really evolve as we're going through therapy. So when you're looking at a patient in the frontline setting, maybe Brad, I'll start with you. What are you looking at in terms of goals of treatment there? I mean, your goals of treatment, unfortunately, you know, I think what we used to think was a completely incurable disease, that may not be the case anymore. So with the advent of Checkmate 214, and there's a thought that you know, we can offer these patients what was once thought to be unattainable, which is a cure, like a complete response rate. So that's really what we want to think about is like, is that something that we can offer these patients? Are we able to offer them a complete response rate and hopefully a prolonged treatment-free interval, if not a cure? So I think that's something that has really changed in the past couple of years. You know, you used to say, well, we cannot cure you, but maybe that's not the case anymore. And so I think that's gonna be something you have to entertain and that sort of comes into play when you start thinking about what decisions you make. Because as while the data for, you know, the TKIO combinations is certainly very intriguing with impressive response rates, improvement overall survival with some of them, the CR rates that we've seen are still gonna be the highest, at least right now, are still the highest with the mold map, ipilimumab. And so that needs to be something that you take in consideration with a patient when you're talking about their, their options and what their goals are. Can you talk more about that, TN, the goal of CR in this setting? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been, as you say, unattainable for a lot of our patients. And if we can actually get their disease to completely melt away, you know, on their scans and say their lung nodules disappear and their liver mets go away, you know, it's an amazing feeling to, to say that to a patient. Um, and so absolutely, um, and it, if we can affect that 10%, 10.8% um, res, uh, complete response rate in the nivolumab, ipilimumab patients, well, that's all, um, we're, we're all in. Um, I think it's um, sometimes when we're selecting strategies in that first line setting, though, we talked a little bit about earlier control of disease, and so um, some of these VEGF IO combinations may give us that, you know, and, and a faster time to response. And so there are patients, I think, who are very frail, who if we really need to get to um, a faster response, you know, those are the patients we're pointing toward TKIs first or TKI IO strategies um, in, in that first line setting. That makes sense. Now, you know, I, I guess this isn't one of the longitudinal goals, Neeraj, but, you know, there certainly is a healthy cohort of patients with de novo metastatic disease where we're still thinking about cytoreductive nephrectomy, perhaps. And does that weigh at all into your decision-making front line? Absolutely. Especially, like, when, when we know that we cannot use VEGF TKI for these patients who are going for cytoreductive nephrectomy. And I don't think it is, it is not going to be pursued, the strategy, even with the negative... Caramina trial, I, in, my, in, my, in our practice, cytoreductive nephrectomy is very much pursued uh, for patients who are favorable risk, up on the better side of intermediate risk. There's a very substantial number of patients who are undergoing cytoreductive nephrectomy. And for these patients, the best regimen I can think of is the EP-NEVO regimen, because surgeons can actually operate while they're getting treatment with ipilimumab nivolumab unlike VEGF-TKI, where wound healing is always a concern for those patients. I tend to agree with you there. It becomes such an issue when to discontinue drug, that delay in starting therapy. Mm -hmm. No surgeons here at the table, so <laughs> tell us what's happening at Duke. No, I think it's really a matter of patient selection, and I think you're right. You know, the CARMINA trial enrolled patients with high disease burden, a lot of extra renal disease burden, so um, high burden of metastatic disease. And so, you know, we saw from the CARMINA trial that, um, you know, sunitinib first actually gets a portion of those patients to consolidative nephrectomies, right? And there were about 38 patients who actually had a nephrectomy while get, um, actually, after they started this um, early sunitinib. And so, yeah, absolutely. In our practice, you know, it's a patient selection and a matter of disease burden outside of the kidney. And if there's minimal disease outside the kidney and it makes sense, you know, that primary is, um, you know, bleeding, causing hematuria and symptoms, you know, absolutely that first um, step, you know, it's a multidisciplinary discussion, but that first step, a nephrectomy makes sense. I think um, as they're, if they're, if the patient has larger disease outside of the kidney, 
this is a patient that we should be talking about a little bit more of, you know, does my systemic agent early on, you know, will that give a little bit more systemic control so that I can actually get this person to a consolidative nephrectomy? And I actually just referred my first patient um, who had a great response in his lungs, retroperitoneal lymph nodes um, from ipilimumab nivolumab, and I referred him last week um, for a nephrectomy. So in those cases, it also makes sense um, to, to really, um, you know, affect some systemic disease control and then get the kidney removed. And not only consolidative saturative nephrectomy, for those patients who just got nephrectomy done, like we still have to wait for wound healing to happen before we can even start any treatment mm -hmm. in the recent past, sure. right? Now these therapy. patients with immune therapies, with uh, checkpoint inhibitors, we can start them on therapy the day after nephrectomy, right? right? And that's, I think that's a very... If they're out of the hospital. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just making a point. I mean, it's so attractive from that perspective. Absolutely. I mean, I can say our, our rates of cyber reduction nephrectomy have dropped significantly, I mean, since Carmina trial. I think the Carmina trial, despite its limitations, really says that systemic therapy up front is the most important thing, and you don't want to have a delay in systemic therapy. So our policy has really been to put these patients on systemic therapy up front, unless they're symptomatic, um, or like oligometastatic disease, we can get surgical control of all disease. We're really pursuing systemic therapy up front. And then, as everyone sort of said, thinking about sort of nephrectomy in the future. And I do, we do, I do agree that immunotherapy is great and that you don't have to make that decision about when do I stop therapy, when is it safe to stop therapy to take them to the surgery and that you're able to continue systemic therapy as they move on to a surgical procedure. There's a great trial coming out of SWOG, right, um, of cytoreductive nephrectomy in the setting and when to do that. So do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting study. Yeah. So Hyung Kim from Cedars and Elka Vaishampayan from Carmano's Cancer Institute are going to be leading a study where patients uniformly get nivolumab and nipilimumab and there's a randomization between either no nephrectomy or uh, deferred nephrectomy, essentially. I think it's a very pragmatic design. It allows us as medical oncologists yeah. to get that patient going on therapy right away and then segue into surgery if they're randomized to such at a later time point.